Lots of points being raised. Yes. Do you want to pick a few now, or would you like me to collect some more from the audience? You might want to react to a few in <coughs> particular now, and then we'll have a wider discussion. Um, let's firstly thank you very much for the extremely rich commentary that, and you know, your careful thinking and reading of this document, and it's very provocative and mm -hmm. thoughtful. And uh, just to talk first about uh, some of the points raised by Mick Foster, I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, the whole process of thinking about the PRSC and so on had actually begun before the instrument was launched. And that uh, the uh, nature of thinking about the aid modalities and the piloting of this process uh, did begin before the formal launching of the instrument. It was indeed conceived of as the basis for HIPAA debt relief that was part of its original rationale. And also that in the beginning, countries were beginning to formulate their own uh, 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 PRSPs, if you like, or at least national development plans, let me put it that way. And that some of these got subsumed into PRSPs, some of them ran parallel to PRSPs. Uh, with you know a lot of confusion on both sides as to you know the need for this parallelism, I think we at the bank also realized that um, to some extent there was at least in the beginning particularly this unease in the process, and we we've, we've heard of cases where I think it might have been in Ghana where where, where we were told that uh, you know consultants went in later on and produced a very slick PRSP that you know was right sort of pat on the line as far as, uh, and this had nothing to do with the process of discussion within the country. And in fact, you know, these findings have caused unease to us as well. And I think this is why particularly in the later uh, uh, examples of the PRSP, this whole question of ownership um, has been much more carefully approached. And I would contrast these early examples with what happened in places like uh, Vietnam, for example, where initially they had their own country document and later, uh, and then uh, and a separate PRSP document, but later on they decided that it was not worth it and the World Bank would adopt the country's own national plan as the PRSP document. So I think the process did change over time. Uh, I can't say whether this is uniform in all countries, but uh, certainly there have been some notable uh, cases. As far as the uh, implementation distortions of the uh, of the PRS, the, the, the public financial management uh, 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 and procurement issues were concerned, um, it, it would not be surprising if there were such implementation distortions. And in fact, one of our own evaluation findings is that the PFM reforms could not be taken for granted. And in fact, in all the areas where it had more to do with implementation than design change, it was much more difficult to, to bring about uh, a real change. Now, I'm not sure whether this fully addresses your question, but. I think, uh, you know, please feel free to come back on this point and we can try to, um, you know, go over it in, in greater detail. I like very much the way that you tried to contextualize this to um, the current debate in uh, aid processes and particularly um, the Paris Declaration and, uh, you know, recent meetings over the last few years at the Accra meeting and so on which are all going back to the original principles, if you like, of uh, uh, aid effectiveness, i.e. the country ownership, the emphasis on results, and so on. And in fact, I think this has been a little bit uh, what has been uh, keeping the process on track as far as you know the rest of World Bank lending is concerned. So I, mm -hmm. I think that all these other factors have, have um, operated to, if you like, bring out the greater harmonization between this special brand of lending and, and what's happening in, in uh, uh, under the PRSC uh, instrument uh, as a whole. Now, as Just far as... Just one more yes, point and then yes. I'll take it out for questions. Yes, okay, well, then, uh, you know, maybe we can sort of go back to um, some of the other points later. Mm -hmm. I very much appreciated Robert's feedback, particularly your support for the 
simplification of the language and pointing out the stronger language that in fact you use within the country. And now, uh, Marcus, what um, you know, I, I appreciated your going through the the data. I'll check on you know whether these were annualized rates or or total period rates. If they're annualized rates, then of course I wouldn't apply. The, um, the other point about that, though, is that since we're looking at differences and differences, what we are doing is simply comparing the pattern of two different groups of countries over time. And what we're pointing out is that the patterns across these two different countries was fairly similar. And not uh, making a direct comparison between the PRSC countries and the other countries. But, you know, I'd be happy to go back into this in more detail. And I do think there is an awful lot of other, um, you know, data that can be extracted from this. And, you know, I'm happy to also pull out more complementary data on that and, you know, share it together. So let me Great. stop for the time yeah. being. Yes. Any other questions from the, from the floor here? Okay. Joe, Sam, and then Greg. Joe, this is entirely based on Mozambique. And that we're not on any of the other countries. Mm -hmm. Sorry, entirely based on Mozambique and not on any of the other countries. The thing about the policy <coughs> dialogue and conditionality, the effect has been to push conditionality down so that it's taking place at a much lower level and is much more petty. So that the World Bank in Mozambique blocked the hiring of agricultural extension officers, did not allow agricultural training in primary school, insisting it should be in secondary school. It's at that petty a level. That, of course, doesn't show up in the conditionality. The second thing is where you say you want to give greater voice to the World Bank. Mozambique, the biggest battle now between Mozambique and the donors is this desperate effort to push down the, the individual donor demand for <coughs> voice. And a huge struggle. And the Gabuza government has gotten into a lot of trouble by doing things like stopping ministers from meeting ambassadors on one day's notice. It now has to be a week. The donors are still angry about that. Um, final thing, I want to agree with Mick about MDG1. The whole process has led to a shift to social sectors. And that comes out in your data as well. There's less and less money for industry. What you're seeing in Mozambique now is poverty is increasing. And the gap between rich and poor is increasing. And rural poverty is becoming much worse. And that's because of this shift of spending to social sectors and away from productive sectors. And that comes directly out of this process. Okay, I'm going to take a few. Greg, you want to <coughs> tidy and Sam? Many thanks for an interesting presentation. Um, I see you make the recommendation that um, conditionality should be streamlined and simplified. Um, but quite, but right next to this, I see quite a tough and uncooperative response from the management of the World Bank. <laughs> or, but at the same time, the external review of the evaluation is quite positive. So my question is, has any progress been made since the release of the evaluation? And how do you think these sorts of changes might occur? Good question. Why don't you take it, Heidi, and then I'll bring it over to um, Andrew. I have a question, but I've got a comment related to conditionality first, actually, which um, I think it would be, it was really interesting to see that conditionalities had fallen, but perhaps it would be interesting to hear a bit more about how these conditionalities are actually put in place in the first place. Are they suggestions from individual countries, or are they still a largely donor-driven agenda? Um, and then secondly, I think this sort of relates, it goes beyond the evaluation per se, but relates to what Mick was saying about how we're going almost full circle now in terms of what we what was tried to be achieved uh, regarding aid effectiveness since the 1990s in terms of increasing ownership, harmonization, and alignment. Given what um, Mick, you said about you know, the constraints you think the World Bank will face in trying to implement this agenda, how do you think we can take this forward agenda in, a, in a, an effective way? OK, good. Pass it to John, and then we'll come over to Sam. Hi, uh, John Burton. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if it was uh, so easy to identify the specific impact of a change in instrument more as Marcus was saying and the countries that are getting the PRC were getting fairly similar general sorts of budget support uh, before the PRSC 
so it may n not be all that promising just to say it has to be in a big shift in these countries just because we change the nature of the instrument. And also, could we find out more by looking at budget support from different sources of donors, not just the World Bank? Uh, that was one thought. Um, and I also wondered if, if you thought more specifically about the alternative to budget support. So if you'd given you know, either no aid or only project aid, would the impact have been very different? Or uh, does the methodology not enable you to do that? Thank you. Good. And Sam. Um, uh, the question I had is related to uh, the sort of the Paris agenda, but also conditionality, and, and a lot of things people have said actually. It's about complementarity with other instruments. I didn't hear much about that uh, in, the, in the discussion, and I know from experience working in several countries that, uh, in fact, I quoted something recently in a paper from a bank and a bank uh, economist who said um, uh, basically that the PRC is often used informally to leverage discussion on PFM and other issues. Uh, conditions are deliberately kept specific, na achievable, and narrow to enable discussion on other instruments and to leverage simply just dialogue for the first few years in some cases and with a relatively small amount of PRC funding. Um, now, this is a lot more political maybe than, than the kind of discussions that you wanted to have, but um, the roles and, and, and positions of the different instruments in, co in complement to each other is a very important issue, I think, and it'd be interesting to hear your opinion. We recently, Tim, Tim Williamson and myself recently uh, finished a paper I did published yesterday looking at a kind of some suggestions for the roles of different instruments in Uganda. Interesting to hear your thoughts on that as well. Very good. Anything else? Okay, so certainly sort of convergence in some of the comments. And do yes. you want to pick up on some of those? Very interesting questions. Thank you so much. Um, and let me see first. Uh, the points about uh, Mozambique uh, and uh, the fact that conditionality there has sort of been pulled down and this, uh, the attempts by the government to shield themselves from all the requests of individual donors. It doesn't surprise me at all. And looking at our 27 c c countries evaluated here, Mozambique was the single largest uh, uh, donor network among them. I think last we called Mozambique had 19 donors for budget support. But this is an extraordinary number, even relative to other countries receiving budget support. So I think the situation in Mozambique is a little bit um, more extreme, perhaps, than, than in other countries where the donor groups have tended to be smaller and uh, where the achievement of harmonization has not necessarily been quite so, uh, so serious. And the question of the streamlining and simplification and, you know, di uh, 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 what the bank has done about it. Yes, indeed, you correctly interpreted that this was one of the recommendations that came up with, you know, against some conflict within the World Bank. And management's position was very much that they've already streamlined and they've already simplified, and there's really nothing more that we need to do about it. And why were we going on about the need for more streamlining and simplification? Uh, all I can say is that it remains an un. un uh, uh, resolved issue between the bank and the bank's management, the IEG of the bank and the bank's management. The bank has now adopted a process called the MAR process, the Management Action Record process, where it keeps track of all non-implemented non recommendations and we try to set up an annual schedule of review with management of the extent to which IEG's recommendations were adopted or not. And in fact, in this most recent annual report that we did for the bank, um, we talked a great deal about the follow-up methodology, not only at the World Bank, but at the IFC and MEGA as well. And we also had contrast with other entities outside the World Bank and tried to show where the World Bank does better and worse in terms of you know, resolving conflicts between its evaluation group. And uh, so this is part of a wider story. It's not just this one recommendation. There's, there's, there's an ongoing debate with management about these kinds of um, situations when they arise. Now, in terms of the conditionalities and what about the process of conditionality, I think that's a very interesting point. And it's not just numbers. And in fact, I have to say that 
I also felt that in a way we didn't look enough at the depths of conditions. And you know, you might have a smaller number in the later programs, but they may in fact be bundling together mm. more under you know the umbrella of a single condition. And, and I felt that we hadn't really unscrambled that enough. Uh, and I agree with you also that this whole question of the process may not have been, uh, could have um, had more attention. The only thing I will say on that though is that we try to look at alignment to country objectives separately through our interviews with the stakeholders. And we try to ask them, you know, did you feel that this was being imposed from outside or did you feel that this was something coming from yourselves? And, I was actually surprised at the large number of countries which actually did claim a pretty high level of ownership. And you know, there were plenty of countries in Africa where, you know, for example, places like Benin and uh, uh, you know, Mali and so on, where they were, they, they were really saying that this is now our own program. So to that extent, we, we were able to evaluate you know, the origins, if you like, of, of conditionality from there. So how to go ahead, that's a big question. I don't think that we would be able to necessarily you know, resolve that here. And I think the complementarity with other instruments, you know, it, it, it does remain um, a, a big issue. And this is linked a bit to the other question about how to evaluate one instrument. And mm. uh, we did look at the complementarity indirectly in terms of the links to sector uh, lending. So there we tried explicitly to explore substitutability in practice and you know, what country units felt about the extent to which, uh, and you know, the general finding was that in fact uh, each has its own role in place and that there is complementarity between these instruments. So the how to you know, budget support from other donors, and I think your question really came down eventually to how to establish the counterfactual. I, I don't think that's an easy one to resolve. You know, what would have happened if you hadn't done this? Uh, and all I can say is that our attempts to establish a counterfactual was through this business of control groups. But it's an imperfect methodology in the best of circumstances. And, uh, can I just ask you on that question? Yes. With, your, with your control group, and I can't recall actually, although I have looked at this, it's, it was yes. a while ago. In the non-PRC countries, those were still countries that were in receipt of budget support, but just not necessarily a bank PRC, they, right? they were, well, some of them may have been in receipt of budget support and some of them may not have been. Um, they did not have the sort of better instrument of budget, you know, predictable, regular, long-term budget support of the World Bank. Over this period, some of them had received development policy loans which were one shot, yeah. essentially, and uh, which yeah. were you know, uh, ad hoc. And, but uh, uh, most of them had received some form of project assistance. Uh, so basically, there were other better performing IDA countries. Uh, we didn't try to make sure that all of them had received budget support, either from other donors mm. or from the World Bank in different forms. But it potentially it produces some noise. Yes, it does. It, it does. I mean, you could think of whether you should further that group more and yeah. Yeah. No, no, sure. add more controls and that. You'd simply lose sample size as mm. the trade-off. So. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other uh, questions, Hugh, from the back? Yes, it is. <coughs> it's a sort of changing more pro-growth. 
Great, thank you. Anything else? Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to have any direct comments on the evaluation, um, but it did bring to light a number of issues. I'm more going to comment on, on what Mick was saying and comments, I'm afraid, rather than, um, than uh, questions as such. But I think this tension between what the, the few years uh, different periods that I manage budget support programs, the tensions between what goes in the sector program and what goes on the general budget support program are very strong mm -hmm. and very operational. And I don't think I think there's a lot more work to be done as to how to figure that out and how to bring back in um, some of the growth elements back into the, the general budget support program. But it's certainly that was a tension that was felt very strongly. And then I saw, I guess, a pet peeve really on the PFM side. I was interested to hear that you said that the PFM action plans tend to focus on low-hanging fruit, tend to focus on changes to systems which can be put in place, and then the issue of measurement and imp measurement of implementation or implementation full stop um, isn't really taken up. And I think, I would guess, my pet peeve is that some of the donors, and actually, to be fair, recipients as well, like to see changes in systems, new information systems put in place, which are visible, mm -hmm. which actually frustrate implementation and can often cause chaos rather than improve it. So it's not just you're not improving implementation, you're actually frustrating it. So, um, sorry, I couldn't help myself mm. on those <laughs> two comments. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, I suppose I have a, 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 a sort of reflection too. I mean, the, the, the valuation kind of takes us up to now um, and looks back over the last sort of uh, six, seven years of, of, uh, of implementation history, but where do you think we're going now in terms of DPLs in the bank? I mean, you, you, the, the, is it likely that the DPL instrument and will continue to grow and expand as a share of lending? Is it likely that they will, as might be predicted in other um, development agencies, begin to either stay static as a percentage of overall lending or actually decline? as things change in the wider environment and particularly as emphasis is moved towards a, maybe an agenda more focused on fragile states or more focused on uh, at supporting the productive sectors in, in the context of development. So I'd be quite interested to know whether you have any reflections having done the evaluation and, and got quite close to the, the family DPL yeah. instruments and where they might go. Yes, maybe just to uh, pick up some of the earlier questions. First, the question about the PRS versus the PRSC. Indeed, the PRSC was only supposed to be extended to countries which already had some sort of poverty reduction strategy. Now, did that strategy always get couched in terms of increased uh, support to the social sector? And was there a conflict with the growth objective not necessarily so. Quite interestingly, if you look at Mozambique, in fact, the poverty reduction strategy quite explicitly says it wants to achieve poverty reduction but through faster growth. And so it's a broad-based growth in poverty reduction. Well, I'd, I'd like to hear your views on mm -hmm. it. I think that was also the case in Ghana and the case in Pakistan that uh, different countries have put different degrees of emphasis on you know, how they wanted to achieve their poverty reduction. I think in Ghana, they explicitly said that they wanted to expand tertiary education because they felt that this would you know, lead to new technocratic generation and so on. So there was flexibility in terms of how this was interpreted across different countries. On the uh, public financial management, as you mentioned, that you know some donors actually want to put these systems in place. Um, I do have sympathy for this. I think that um, there were another number of points at which we found that donor-imposed systems actually sort of obfuscated a little bit the achievement of certain final results. And this was particularly when you had these multi-layer paths with you know, extremely similar but marginally different conditions, which led to a proliferation of indicators for the country concerned. And all of this you know, ha was essentially feeding the donors after a certain point and not you know, contributing to the essential process. So you know, I, I do agree that that's something which 
came out as one of the things to watch out against. Now, the final uh, point about the future of development policy lending at the bank and to sort of step back to this optic a little bit. Um, to give some background, development policy lending at the bank has actually been going down as a proportion until about 2008. So in the years 2005 and 6 to about 2008, the fraction of bank lending, which was DPL lending, had been slightly trending downwards. And this was dramatically reversed over the last two years of the crisis, crisis lending, mm -hmm. when the overall volumes of uh, uh, disbursement of World Bank funds more or less tripled. And a huge part of this was in the form of uh, policy-based lending. And um, so I think the issue is not only one of trend, but also, if you like, one of cycle, mm -hmm. which is that if you're in a period where you want something which is quick disbursing and, you know, which is usable for a sudden fiscal shock or something, we're going to go back to policy-based lending. And so there is a certain, you know, value from that perspective. But also to, to take a look at the content of that policy-based lending, I think some of the most innovative examples of this are, you know, which have really gone oddly enough in the vision of the original uh, PRSC founders is um, the case of Mexico, where you had these huge DPLs of, you know, uh, one and a half billion dollars and so on per operation in the last couple of years. And what did the Mexicans want? They wanted one policy adjustment loan and analytic work and nothing else from the World Bank. So they said, forget about all sector operations. We'll take care of that ourselves. We do want the value of your analytic knowledge, so we'll keep the dialogue active in a number of sectors but we only want budget support. And the banks, Latin America region, did consider that Mexico was a reasonable candidate for this and, and that we, we could go in this direction. Now along came the crisis and what were the priorities? They, they did eventually split up that single DPL and they had some parts of it channeled towards climate change yeah. particularly. They had some parts of it particularly oriented towards social protection spending and other things which the Mexicans and you know the bank felt were joint priority areas but you know in a lot of the middle income countries the bank doesn't call the shots no. and there's no poverty reduction strategy you have a letter of development policy which is what the country writes as its letter to the World Bank saying this is what we're planning to do and we meekly attach it to the last page of our memorandum to the president. And, you know, that's approximately it. So, you know, the make con country lending is very much going in the direction of the unquestioned budget support, if you look at its nature and character, you know, with not that much in the way of conditionality. And well, see, that's what's quite interesting, yes. isn't it? Because the PRSC was very much an instrument geared towards low-income countries. Yes. Um, and I suppose it's the it's the relativities of if the PRC is going to now morph into this larger class of policy based <laughs> instrument is the very characteristic uh, with which it was in, endowed in the very beginning essentially just going to disappear into the general class of policy based lending. Well, I think that the general class of policy based lending is essentially doing what the PRSC had thought it was doing. So I don't think the PRSC would lose its character. So, you know, there is better alignment with what the country wants to do because the country begins to increasingly call the shots. I mean, countries like Brazil, mm -hmm. where I also worked for several years, or Mexico, they wouldn't be sitting down and tinkering over conditions. Uh, and, you know, so this, this is retaining what the PRSC tried to do. But look at it, you know, also from the point of view in those countries, um, it's not a question of a multi-donor setup. Mm. You know, typically there aren't any multi-donor arrangements, you know, uh, because if they're not borrowing from the bank, a large number of them are now going to market. Mm. So the alternative to the bank is, you know, what is our emerging market spread? Uh, you know, and they want to look at what, you know, the JP Morgan indexes, and they're not terribly interested in other donors.
And within Africa, I mean, countries like Ghana had uh, it floated its own debt. Uh, I think there were about three floats within Africa in the year immediately preceding the crisis. So I think Uganda too did, did or was it planning to? That you know that's going to be the way that countries go in the future. So I think the bank, you know, if things work well for development, will be there. You know, in times of crisis, will be there for certain types of sector mm -hmm. aid. But the old problems of conditionality and so on. I think that as growth improves and countries get stronger and they get more access to the market. You know, some of that is probably going to dwindle on its own. Mm, true. So I'm going to give the panelists a chance, maybe just for a reflection based yes. on the, uh, the conversation as it's unfolded. Mick, um, just on this on this issue of uh, how do how do we avoid these problems recurring, and where do we go from here? One of the things that always occurred to me about the PRSC was that we're using a very short-term instrument uh, to address what is a medium to long-term problem of poverty reduction. And although the PRSCs were approved in series, they all were about annual approvals through the World Bank Board. And it would seem that the logic of partnership and of ACRA and of Paris and all the rest of it was, would be that we need a medium-term instrument, which we used to have. We used to do it through projects. We used to do it through, mm -hmm. through, through other medium-term instruments. And I don't see any reason in principle why we shouldn't, if we're interested in supporting the social sectors, have some kind of long, medium to long-term commitment well, it might be variable year on year. It might be plus or minus 20%, but at least the core of it over a five-year commitment period is there pending anything other than major force measure or a major major breakdown in the partnership. But assuming that doesn't happen, you've basically got it, and you, you can then hold the policy dialogue at convenient times, and you, you end up working within the government's budget cycle without without the money arriving at, long term, at the wrong time and in disrupting the budget halfway through. The other, the other issue is, is this issue about macro and sectoral and instruments for both levels. And again, I was reading something that, that Dino Morato and I wrote back in 1996. At that time, sorry, this is, this is uh, fiscal of me. But anyway, at that time, it was very clear what we were talking about was an aid architecture, which was saying for cross-cutting issues that are the responsibility of cross-cutting departments, you know, human resource policy, budget allocations, you talk to the Ministry of Finance or you talk to the public. PSC, and that's, that's addressed through a macro instrument, but the details of sector policy, you're still going to need a sector instrument in order to do that, and that, that always seemed to me to make sense, and I never really understood why we, why we ever floated away from, 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 from that process. If you don't do it that way, then you, you end up um, undermining the sector's access to some of the very good uh, professional resources that the bank and other donors have, have potentially got available. Great. Robert, any questions? Yeah, Marcus? Um, two things. One, just to say this issue on the counterfactual and how we work on it. There's a paper that's just literally again hot off the press that's come out of ODI, which is saying, can you not only work out what is the counterfactual with projects rather than with budget support? Because again, that's another way of doing it if it's a choice yeah, of instruments. So this is in our attempt to try and do that. Um, so if you want to see about that, that's all. Mick, I think it's great we should end up in a complete agreement on both the management and the evaluation board, which we need to keep sectors as well as general mm -hmm. budget support. I think there's an entire very strong agreement on that side. But Mick, I also strongly agree that one of the things that's missing is this plea for multi-annual. Yeah, and well, it would be really good to, to have that. I haven't seen, heard that say so clearly, and I think you're absolutely right. That, you know, one of the quarters from Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Well, the final word, perhaps, is simply that they are supposed to be multi-annual. And the reason that they're not called multi-annual is to get away from this uh, problem of legally binding things which float uh, from one year to the next. And But they're all supposed to be conceived within a medium-term framework, and they are supposed to all be series. And they're supposed to go through the entire period of you know, the country assistance mm -hmm. strategy. So they've been typically three to four to a series, uh, and that's the standard design, although legally they're only a single instrument, basically to make it easier for the country. So Sorry, to make it easier for the country to have a, a, a single annual process? Well, yes, because uh, otherwise uh, you would have this problem of legally binding conditions across multi-year tranches.
So that's what used to happen in the old structural adjustment loans. You had a structural adjustment loan that spanned three years, and it had conditions for uh, year one, conditions for year two, and conditions for year three. And then you had to go and get a legal waiver if some of these were not met. So this time around, they're just saying, look, we have this overall idea, but you come back next year, and if, only, if you've only done about two-thirds of this and you want to twiddle a little bit with some of the others at the margin, that's all right by us. We'll just take that with a separate legal operation. Mm -hmm. So I think there may be some slight sense of deviation between theory and practice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in theory, yes, that seems yes. the right, that exactly the right thing. Mm -hmm. But I suspect mm -hmm. in practice what happens is that the whole thing gets annualized and, and, and actually quite heavy. Um, as an annual process in practice. Thank you very much indeed. I think you've um, stimulated a lot of, of interesting questions and the evaluation you know, is a very uh, strong piece of, of work. And uh, thank you very much, Kenny, to ODI to present it. Um, and thank you all for coming along on a Friday afternoon. So thanks yes. a lot. Thank you very much.